pod sass by putting the sass back in sassy sponsored by leader pro where you can book demos with target customers on demand and fill your sales pipeline instantly hey everybody welcome to another episode of pod sass i'm your host chris shang and today we have eric westerkamp is that correct yes it is uh from caliber mind where are you uh coming to us from eric i'm coming to you from right outside of boulder colorado oh nice very beautiful area yeah it is Cool, cool. Is the majority of the team based there now? Is that where you guys are housed or is it everybody's? Yeah, originally we were all based here, kind of in Boulder to Denver. I'd say that now we are 50, maybe even a little bit less here in Colorado. Uh, a lot of the team is in the Denver area and then we're pretty spread out. I've got a, a team in Chicago, a team in New York, Seattle, California, you know, kind of, you know, yep. Texas spread out of it. Yep. Fully adopted the the remote mentality, I feel like. Yeah. So before we kind of just to get to know you a little bit more about your journey as an entrepreneur, why don't you tell us a little bit more about Caliber Mind and then who makes a good customer for you guys? Sure. Yeah. So Caliber Mind, uh, we're an organization that has a, a SaaS piece of software that helps marketing revenue operations teams really know exactly how sort of all their campaigns are performing, how all the accounts and prospects they're touching are actually engaging with them and you know the different assets and content and things like that on their website and really kind of gives a really good insights on like what do you do next to sort of move the needle as a marketing rev ops team sure right um, our customers tend to be um, CMOs CROs and, and you know VPs of demand gen people that are really heavily involved in the go to market function uh, we typically sell it to high tech companies that we've got a smattering of other companies in other industries got it Interesting. Uh, yeah, I mean, definitely my language and, and I would love to dive into a little bit more in terms of, you know, how you guys tackle this problem, um, especially because I know we personally have dealt with this in terms of the idea of attribution and, you know, Google Analytics, Google Tag Manager having the issue, you know, with a lot of the, the, that cookie kind of problem um, being a third party. Um, so how do you, you know, get, get I guess, credible attribution ultimately is the, the end of the day. Um, yeah. But before we dive into all that good stuff, would love to just to know your personal story a little bit more. Um, so we like to do these things, uh, just a series of rapid fire questions. Um, nothing too crazy, but if you're ready to do it, we can kick things off. Sure, let's do it. Awesome. First question is uh, favorite entrepreneur and or startup story. And it could be one of the same or two completely different. Yeah. Um... I can't say that I have a favorite entrepreneur. Um, I will say that I, I, I appreciate um, uh, reading about a bunch of, you know, sort of like leaders in different industries that have really kind of achieved some great things. Like the one I think I'm reading, finishing up right now is Bob Iger's book, The Ride of a Lifetime, right? Which has a, a whole bunch of sort of amazing stories about leadership and what happened there with Pixar and stuff like that. Um, what I like is that kind of each one of these gives you a core insight something that you really need to focus on like the one i took out of that is like you know innovate or die mm. uh, when it comes to startups um i really love startups where they've kind of gone into incumbent industries and really done something disruptive um example would be like zoom like you know we're, yep. which we're using right here um you know that's an industry where you had players like google cisco microsoft i mean really well-established players and they went in and dominated because they just brought something that I thought removed friction from the industry. Like if you, I'm sure you remember using these tools yeah. before, it was like half the people couldn't seem to log on. There was all these problems and they just made it easy and yeah. therefore they won the market, right? So they took something complicated or with a lot of friction and made it super easy. And I just love those stories. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think Zoom made it consumer friendly, right? So the end user friendly versus like, you know, the WebExes or like some of those like if you log into them nowadays, it seems so clunky and it's so like built for an organization versus for an individual. Yeah. Interesting. Um, yeah. Love those two. Uh, next question here is, you know, going back to when you were like eight, nine, 10 years old, do you remember what you wanted to be as a kid? I do. Um, I wanted to create special effects for movies. Oh, awesome. Very cool. And I remember, um, I even went to the point where I, um, I sent George Lucas a personal uh, a personal note. I must have been maybe we're closer to 12, 13. But you know, could I get an internship at uh, at um, at uh, Light and Magic over there? His uh, his little his his organization did not get a response back, surprisingly. Um, but yeah, that's what I wanted to do. Awesome. I I did something very similar, probably around like ten or eleven years old. Uh, mine was sending it to the Lakers organization and making a pitch for myself to become a walk on player. 
Um, I, <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think I emphasized like my free throw shooting percentage is really good and there's a case for it. But anyways, um, next question here is uh, a little bit more personal, but it's the idea of most painful experience. And it can be a personal or, you know, professional painful experience. But I preface this with the fact that I think you know, our periods of most exponential growth tends to stem from places of extreme discomfort. So has there been any kind of like, you know, experience that you've gone through personally or professionally, where it's like obviously super difficult or trying during that time, but was an inflection point uh, in terms of, you know, character, some kind of like character building realization? Yeah. Um, you know, my first startup was a company by the name of Quickstream Software. And, um, and I was much, much younger when I, when I did that company. And in that company, uh, it eventually did okay, but it went through some hard times. And I remember the first time when we were looking at cash flow and things, and I'm like, you know, man, I've got to, I've got to make, I've got to change the organizational structure. I've got to cut back. I've got to make things. And a lot of the people in the company, they were friends of mine, right? These are people I knew that I knew outside yeah. of work and things like that. And I had to make that really hard decision to kind of like, okay, I've got to lay some of you off. I've got to do things, and it's really hard. Right. And it was the first time in my career I'd really gone through something like that where I kind of, you know, really owned the decision and had to kind of execute on it. Um, that was hard. And I think yet you grew then like, how do I manage it? How do I message this out to the team? How do I work with the people afterwards that are still here or things like that? Where do you, what would you say is one of like the biggest learnings from that experience? Um, I think that a lot of, you know, there's sort of some some sayings that trying like, well, it's actually harder on the people that are left. And and I think what I what I realized was that's not even remotely true. That's BS. It's really hard on the people that are being let go. Really mm -hmm. hard. And you and you have to like you have to might maybe make some of these changes, but you have to do it with empathy and you have to realize that it's really hard on them. You know, and 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 often it's um you have to talk to them about why, um, why you're making the change, what's going on, be open and honest. Right. Um, but you have, to, but if it's the right thing to do, you still have to kind of do it for the organization. Yeah. Absolutely. Yep. Um, so going back to, you know, Caliber Mind or even like that first startup, right. Uh, and I know you had a little bit of a break in between doing, doing a little bit more of like the sales side of things, but um, I'm curious to ask a little bit more questions there. But, you know, in, in that entrepreneur journey, in starting anything from the ground up, obviously it can be super difficult. Um, when your back's against the wall, what's kind of motivating you in that 25th hour? The team. To be honest, like when, when when you're really there and you're and your back's against the wall of the company, you, to some extent you're doing it for yourself, but you're kind of really doing it for the rest of the company and the team and the people that are there. You have your investors and stuff like that um, that you're doing it for them also. But a lot of people in companies like this have put in; they've sat, made big sacrifices, yeah. time, energy, salaries, things like that. They're really kind of betting on something kind of working too. And so with the back of the wall, you really need to figure out like you're doing it, why are you doing it, who are you doing it for. And a lot of times it's, it's for everyone else that's there, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and so I obviously saying saying that uh, it can be very stressful. Um, is there anything that you personally go to to decompress? Uh, mountain biking. Oh, that's a good one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I love to do skiing, like outdoor stuff. And and when it gets really stressful, I I I need to every once in a while just get out, get on the bike, go ride for a while, just let things settle back. back. Um, Absolutely. There's nothing like getting on a, on a wall and realizing like you, like it, everything collapses down to what you're doing right then. And the others yeah. just kind of falls away. Yep. Absolutely. Um, obviously as a founder to you, wear uh, you tend to wear a lot of different hats, uh, a lot of skill sets that you didn't never thought you would pick up or learn. Um, has there, has there been one that you have picked up along the way that you've had a strong emotional disposition towards like either loved or hated and just again, never thought that you would be doing it. Um, yeah, so I started I, a bit of an interesting career arc. I started um, degree in computer science and started writing code and as a software engineer for for, for a number of years. Um, and then did, did my first startup, but we were kind of a consulting company that morphed into a product company. Um, getting involved with, to be honest, sales and getting involved with understanding how to deliver the product. You know, originally I went there because I had to, right? It, was, it wasn't a comfort zone for me at all. Um, you know, I had to, re I mean, I literally had to learn like, what is a value proposition? Like, why do you care? Like as a software engineer, like this, this is not the things you're taught or learned. Yeah. Really go through that arc. And um, I found the person that I really enjoyed it. Like that I found that I actually really liked getting in front of customers and explaining to them why this was going to make a difference for their business, how it was going to help them, right? How we were going to support them, right? And I found that that I really enjoyed that. 
to the point where I eventually ended up running some, some big sales teams and organizations and things like that. Very cool. Um, next question here is, is two parts, but number one, do you have a bucket list? And then two, what's one of the more ambitious items on that bucket list? That bucket list, you know, I, yes and no. Um, I want to go to Hokkaido and go ski. Okay. Um, that is kind of one of the ones that's on my, on my, on my short-term bucket list. It's, uh, to get out there and do some skiing. Some of that would be, would be incredible. Um, uh, I'd like to have enough time to go and explore a little bit more around South America and Patagonia and some of those areas, things that require weeks, if not yeah. months to go do, which just hasn't fit into a startup schedule yeah. at any point in time. Uh, I'd love to be able to do some of those things. Very cool. Uh, the last question here is the idea of legacy, but more importantly, you know, what do you want to leave? Uh, what kind of impact do you want to leave on this earth ultimately before you leave it? That's a kind of a hard question. So I don't, I don't think about legacy to be honest that much. Um, I, I want, I, what I care about is family and friends. What do they think about me when I go? Did I spend enough time with them? Right. Cause that's really hard when you're doing the types of stuff, when you're involved in high tech, it's very easy to sort of get sucked and spend, to be honest, to ignore a lot of those other things. I want to know that at the end of all that, that my family felt that I paid attention to them, that, that, that was there for them when they needed it. Friends the same way. And then third, I want to feel like I contributed something to my community. And that's, to be honest, why I do businesses and startups and things like that. It's like, I feel like um, by growing a business in an area, you're providing really good jobs, you're providing incomes for people, you're providing a work environment that's hopefully very positive for them and things like that. And I feel by doing that, you're really helping out. And if I can do that by the end, I, you know, I'll feel pretty good about it. Very cool. All right, that wraps up the series of rapid fire questions. But um, yeah, you have a very interesting story. Uh, you know, just kind of briefly doing some some background around you. But you know, uh, you said, as you already mentioned or alluded to, but you you started off as an engineer. You started doing coding, right? Um, and I noticed very early on, you mentioned that first startup. That that's kind of like your first foray into, I guess, entrepreneurship, uh, more of a consultancy, and then evolved into a product. Um, can you walk us through what that looked like? You know, there's a few chapters here I want to dive into, but just that first section of it and, you know, versus like doing a lot of, you know, corporate work or, you know, going to starting there, why did you end up starting that company in the first place? And, and what was the impetus for it? it? It was an interesting journey. So, you know, out of college, degree in computer science, I ended up working for a, a, a startup right out of college for a year or so, staying back in Virginia Tech and Blacksburg. Uh, then, the sort of Colorado, the West kind of called a little bit. I moved out here, ended up working for um, big telecommunication provider, MCI. I, I was I, I was lucky enough to be involved in some projects there where um, I, I was running a small team that was doing new dev for MCI. And we were working with a group out of Sun Microsystems at the time that was working on a product called Oak at the time. Well, we had access very early to early prototypes, started using it. We had some of the first production versions. Oak eventually became Java, right? Mm -hmm. So we ended up working really early with some of this technology. And because of that, I was able to sort of, a uh, friend of mine and I were able to kind of spin out and create a small consulting company doing this because we were some of the first adopters of the, and understanding the technology, right? Sure. And so kind of got a little bit lucky there. Over time, as we built that up, we realized that some of the technology that we had built really to just interact with customers um, was actually some of the first sort of web-based, Java-based document management systems. And so we kind of, we raised some money, we brought in some expertise and we started building a document management company um, and, and learned a lot there. Super young. And, um, you know, what I realized a couple of things was at that time, you know, Colorado and Denver and Boulder have become a much more active um, space for startups and companies. And back then, it was pretty tough. There weren't a lot out of here, right? So you kind of learned about how important it may be to be tied into like to Silicon Valley or at the time Chicago had a lot of companies doing this, right? And what was going on there, right? Um, so that was kind of interesting. Um, you know, and then we built that company up. Um, you know, we ran it for God, probably about eight, nine years and eventually sold it to a public company um, off the East Coast. Got it. Okay. Um, what were some of the biggest learnings? Obviously, like this is your second one. And so we will dive into that later. But some of the takeaways from that first experience, you know, it could be positive, negatives, you know, where were some of the highlights, some of the lowlights from, from that? Because eight to nine years, I mean, like for your first venture, I mean, you already kind of surpassed the average of the norm. And so... Um, 
you know, I'm sure that there was a lot that that went into that. Yeah, um, I mean, probably my biggest learning was was uh, th that if you can't just focus on the technology, you can't you like you have to focus on delivering the product the customers really want. What's the value proposition? And also, what I realized was that even if you have some of the best technology, if you don't really have the right go to market motions and the right sales team and the right things, it won't matter. Yeah. Right. And I saw, I saw it to be honest, time and time again, companies that had little, like more funding, better go to market, but probably worse products accelerate out. Right. Um, and so it was kind of a wake up experience. So like, you know, it's important to have really good tech in a product, but it's just as important to, um, to how, how do you marry that with your go to market functions? How do you marry that with value propositions and how do you, how do you get that in front of the right people and give them your message? Cause if you can't get it in front of them with the right message, it won't matter how good it is. Sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, I have a saying that I, it, that a lot of times is, you know, you could, I could be selling the cure for cancer, but if I'm using the wrong channels like email, LinkedIn to do it all day long, where they're super crowded and super noisy channels, like it doesn't matter. It's not about the product. It's getting, especially in the startup world, like having that brand awareness, brand trust, brand equity, where somebody's willing to invest their time is essentially it right in the very beginning. So, um, yeah, I mean, Okay, so you 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 started that first business eight to nine years, ended up selling it to a publicly traded company, right? And and you allude, you you've already been talking about this, but go to market and all these things, and then learning the sales game. So you spent a number of years after that first startup in the sales world, right? Was that was that knowing kind of where you you felt like you're lacking strength and you wanted to fine tune it? Yeah. So um, when I joined, um, it was a company called EasyLink Services. They were they were mid sized technology company, probably eighty ish. 60 to 80 million when I kind of joined. Um, and I ended up taking over their product management group and then eventually I ended up taking over all of their channel sales. And it ends up that um, I just took over channel sales because um, to be honest, when I was at Quickstream, our entire go-to-market was channels. Like it was all OEMs and people basically integrated our product. Like that's how we went to market. So yeah. I kind of understood that motion. So I ended up taking that over there. Um, and then I stayed at EasyLink um, you know, over time, we built that company from 80 to about 200 and something million, 240, somewhere in that range, right? Um, so, so really kind of grew through some acquisitions and things like that. And I was involved in helping acquire some companies and even selling some divisions and things like that. And then running a piece of the revenue at the company, um, you know, relatively substantial piece of the revenue. Um, and that really taught me much more about selling, selling motions, something like that. I was able to um, have a couple of really, you know, pretty good mentors there too. You know, we had um, uh, one one gentleman, you know, ran big chunks of IBM sales and he came over to help us out. I reported to him, learned a lot there, had another uh, sales leader that I worked with or worked for at, uh, when we got sold to OpenText. Um, amazing salesperson, but really knew how to run sales teams and organizations. I would say that I learned two different things. One was very metrics driven. How do you run a forecast call? How do you do all the, like, how do you know what data? And the other one was much more about how to go sell. Yeah. And so, and, and the, the, they're different skill sets. And so I was able to kind of hopefully absorb some of that from those two. Got it. Um, and so walk us through, you know, like I know you, you worked at a few companies in uh, as a sales leader. Uh, and before you started Caliber Mine, you know, was it like seven years ago at this point, six, seven years ago? Yeah. So, so it's interesting for Caliber Mind, I didn't start Caliber Mind. Um, I was brought in. So I um, went, yeah, we, um, we had uh, at EasyLink, we then sold it to OpenText. Then I ran um, a sales organization, OpenText. I worked for a private equity firm, kind of recruited me out to go do, um, they were rolling together like sales, seven sales teams and marketing teams and did that for a while. Um, I knew the founder here um, in Boulder of Caliber Mind and um, Raviv Turner. And he, I, I had actually looked at the product a couple of times when I was at those organizations because I was having real issues when I was running those organizations, consolidating data and getting all this data and getting insights together. And I was looking for products to help me do that. Yep. And I actually ran into this product. It was pretty young and pretty raw at the time. And so getting it into these was going to be a bit of a push. But when um, when I when I left the private equity uh, roll up, you know, I was talking to Raviv and I, I was kind of like, you know, what if I help you for a little bit and kind of get this thing launched, you know? And so I came in, helped them pivot, do things like that. Um, and within about six to eight months, a key came to me and the board came to me and asked me to kind of like, uh, you know, 
originally goal was kind of do this, then probably go do something else. Sure. Stick on and uh, take over as a CEO. Got it. Okay. Um, In 2018, I joined. 19, I took over um, as okay. CEO. It's kind of been when, and helping them kind of grow the company since then. You know, can you walk us through what that conversation looks like? You know, from uh, how did they approach you in terms of becoming a CEO? And then also, you know, for you evaluating the decision, obviously, like being already coming from a world where you already started a business and then like, you know, where the buck stops with you now as a CEO. I mean, um, it's a lot of responsibility. I'm sure it's to a certain extent. I mean, it's it's also a personal decision, you know, to make that kind of level of a commitment because it's not the, you know, it's no longer like, going in and, and, and talking to somebody else and, and, you know, working for them necessarily, obviously you still have to answer to a board and investors, but, uh, but it's, it's a lot more different, right? It's, it's a lot more of a different of experience. So yeah, talk us about, talk to us about uh, how they approached you and ultimately how you made that decision that it was the right decision for you. You know, um, I'll give a lot of credit to um, Ravi, the original founder, you know, he approached me with it. Um, and I think he realized um, himself that, taking this company to the next level. We were at a bit of an inflection point. We're starting to really kind of grow it. We're making some really good sales, but running an organization as it kind of grew these steps wasn't really his skill set, right? And so he came to me and said, hey, would you be interested in it? Um, and I said, maybe, you know, I need to kind of really think about it, talk with my wife and the family and stuff like that. Um, and worked with him and worked with the board to come up with something that kind of made a lot of sense, right? Um, I think it, it was, I don't know if it was a hard decision. I was, to be honest, I was already kind of running sales marketing and operations and, and a piece of it and helping them make the pivot. The question, do I want to really have the full responsibility for sure. the fundraising and making the capital and stuff like that? Because of some of my background um, in product management and, and we did some, some M&A stuff, I had a relatively heavy background with finance and running operating models and things like that. So I was already kind of really helping the company do run the books and the company sure. and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't that big of a stress to kind of step up from an operations perspective. It was more, do they want the commitment? Yeah. Um, you know, and I'll be honest, I look back at like the team, the people, because that's really what it comes back down to. Like, did I, did, you know, when you make that commitment, you know that it's, it's this isn't like a year or two. Exactly. Right? You know, you're like saying, okay, I'm going to really give it up my all for, for, you know, however long it takes. This could be five, six years more, right? To get it to the point where everybody wants it to really be. Are these people I really want to hang out with for that long? You know, um, is it a team that I think that could, is it a product and a space I think has something we can really grow in? So I had a lot of internal conversations sure. about that. You know, um, yep. and eventually with the thought that yeah, team yep. is great, product is great. Yeah, like a little bit more of a personal question too, but I mean, like obviously financial motivators, right? Like as a as a sales leader and given your experience, I mean, you could go out and carve kind of out your own destiny, you know, it's not uncommon to end up, you know, making mid six figures, you know, kind of deal to, to even seven figures in some instances, right. Selling enterprise, but, um, you know, and then becoming a CEO, I'm sure like of a, still like an earlier stage company, even though you're helping with the pivot, a lot of moving parts, right. Still, still somewhat of like a risk there. Uh, and like you're saying, it's going to take a certain level of commitment to, you know, get not only the company to where it needs to be, but ultimately getting to evaluation or some kind of like exit point where, you know, you can realize some of the reward of that as well, right? Was that part of the decision-making process for you too? Because obviously that plays into all the mechanics of a team, product, et cetera, uh, to make sure that the outcome is there. Yeah, it's got to make sense, right? You got to look at it and say like, is there a decent enough chance? Because that's absolutely true. It's like, you work for a startup, you do this, the, you know, your trade off is, you know, really pay and things like that for the opportunity that something's going to really, you know, kind of exit at a, at a number that's going to be meaningful for everybody. Right. Sure. Um, yeah, it definitely played in, you know, that everything needs to kind of, you got to run the numbers and the math and say, is it, is it worth the risk? Cause it, there's a real risk to it. Um, you know, but, but more important, it's like, am I going to enjoy it? Am I going to have fun? Right. Because, you know, it gets back to legacy or, or at least at the end of it, you want to look back and say like, at least I, you know, whether or not I made tons of money or not, did I enjoy myself? Did I have a good time? Did I feel like I did good work? Right. Yep. And that plays into it too. And so I think that, that also helps shift the needle toward like go do and take more risk. Cause to some extent there's also, you know, um, in all my, in, in my first startup and in this company, the highest highs and lowest lows 
have been at the startup. Of course. And they're often in the same day. <laughs> you know, like it, it's really compressed. Things are great. They're bad. They're great. They're bad. I mean, it's really compressed, right? It adds stress, but it also means that, you know, there's a lot of excitement when you do these things. And when you win things, it really means something. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the, I think a lot of that comes down to the idea of equity and ownership, right? Like at, at the end of the day, the whole thing is that, you know, whether you're the CEO or one of the early stage employees, at the you have a ton of impact. And so you feel a lot more responsibility, a lot more connected to, I think, you know, not only the process, but the byproduct. Um, and, you know, that being said, what do you think it is about, you know, the entrepreneurial mentality or mindset that, you know, maybe you've seen when you talk to other founders, but also as, you know, relates back to other people who is not built for everybody. Like not everybody has that risk tolerance, right? And, um, but what is it about you that you think that, that you've seen um, that, that, that makes it work um, as well as maybe something you've seen from other founders, mentors, et cetera, where, you know, there's maybe underlying persona traits or pers personality traits that makes it, allows it to be uh, the right fit. You know, um, there's, a, you gotta be able to kind of push that. To be honest, it's a little bit of like, I'll call grit, right? You just gotta be able to push through, like when things get bad and, or, you know, you gotta be able to push through it, right? And, and you've gotta be able to let things go to some extent. Cause like I said, so we, you know, and then you also gotta know like when things get great, this isn't, it's not gonna stay here, right? Mm -hmm. It's gonna, it's gonna normalize, right? So I think it's people that can do it can sort of um, manage and, and, and I think salespeople are very good for this because they have to do this in sales calls all the time. It's like this skills, they gotta make, they gotta hear no, you know, 50 times to get to one yes. It's a lot of rejection you gotta go yeah. through. When you're doing startups, I think there's a lot of that. You got to have some of those same tendencies, you know, raising money, you know, it's exactly the same thing. You go yeah. raise money, you're going to get 50 no's to get to like one yes, you know? Um, so you got to be able to kind of take that and not internalize it too much and not let it become too much a part of like, this isn't working. So there's something wrong with me. Yeah. Right. It's more, you got to be able to step back and be like, something's not working. So what am I going to do about it? and separate the emotions a little bit out so that you can kind of step back and say, okay, now what are we going to do? Put a plan in place and start executing on it, right? Yep. Um, and then you got to be able to sort of just tolerate the ups and the downs and some of those things, right? And tolerate the risk. For sure. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I, I have, I everybody that I've talked to, I mean, that's obviously wow. a part of the conversation. Uh, have yet to figure out how to quantify that, you know, in, 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 in people, right? Um, I am curious to my next question here, which is, you know, as you're building the company and as you, uh, as, you know, as a CEO, as an executive and, and being a part of like, you know, building out a team, um, and culture ultimately, you know, what is, what kind of elements are you looking for in an individual or in the culture that you're trying to provide? Like, do you bring any of those like intangibles that you just mentioned? The idea of grit is, you know, how do you, yeah, how do you quantify that in an interview? Ultimately, is that something you look for? Uh, you know, I don't know that I've figured that out. Like in an interview process, um, I, I'd say that you, you you do your best, and then you look at how people react, and then then you make decisions kind of going forward. Um, I think that um, when I start to think about like culture and what we're looking for in people, you know, you want um, we, we kind of break it down. We call it skill, will, and hill, right? You know, do they have the skills to do it? Do they, do, you know, they have the will to do it, right? And, you know, and can they, get, can they, can they, can they climb it and stay and keep climbing, right? Um, and people, and, and for startups, you kind of need all three, yeah, right? Um, and, and you don't always get that. So we kind of, when we're interviewing and stuff, we're kind of looking for some of those traits. Like they may not have, they may not be as good from a skill perspective, but man, they really want it. Yeah. Right. That, that goes a long ways, right? Um, the other aspect is, you know, we look for um, evidence about how people treat each other. You know, in our in our organization, it's, you know, for us culture, it, it comes down to sort of like ethics and values and some of these things. One of the big things I, I try to push and I even ask people about is, I try to get uncovered is like, are you the type of person that's going to push somebody under a bus or are you going to take accountability for your own actions, right? And even if somebody else is wrong, it, pushing other people under the bus doesn't necessarily help. And so we try to build that, you know, how do I get ahead of that for people coming into the organization and how do we instill that inside of our organization, right? It's okay to bring up issues and things like that, but pointing fingers and pushing people under the bus is not okay from our perspective in our company. Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
Has there been any analogies, you know, just kind of from your personal life or experiences where you feel like mirrors, uh, mirrors your journey as an entrepreneur, as a founder, or even just as a CEO, kind of like all the things that you have to manage on a day to day basis, day to day basis. Um, you know, and I, I mean, I, I, I look at, I think like the arts almost it's, it's a very similar thing where it's like, it, you're still creating, it's still creating it for an audience. You have to resonate with an audience. It's, I mean, it's a little bit, you know, less maybe like data driven in that sense, but, um, but the idea of building, the idea of creating, I think there's a lot of similarities, but I'm curious if you've seen anything like that outside of. Not sure if anything quite, quite like that. It's, I'd say that, you know, I started rock climbing when I was pretty young in college and things like that. And, and when you're doing a, a big climb, especially a big wall or something like that, there's a lot of the, a lot of the same emotions happen as you're, as you're going up and doing something, right? That's interesting. Yeah. Like you may, like you have to control fear. Um, you have to trust yourself. Right? You have to trust your gear. You have to trust the people that you're with, like really trust them, you know, and you have to overcome some of those things. And you're going to have some like moments where you're like deathly scared. It was like some of the worst moments. And then you're going to finish it and you're going to have some of your best moments. Right. And so I, I think that there's some some uh, uh, synergies between that and what a startup is like. It's like you're going to start here. You got to get up there and it's going to be a process to get there. And most, you know, hopefully you make it. Sometimes you won't because you're going to come down, you, you know, but. But uh, but I think there's some um, definitely some linkage between the the emotional state that you go through and between climbing and a startup. For sure. Last question here as we're kind of rounding out on the half hour, but uh, is is where do you see you know Caliber Mind in the next four to five years, right? And you know obviously this is um, a mission, a vision that you very much aligned with, uh, not necessarily as a founder, but ultimately as 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 coming in as a CEO. Um, and you know, is this, is this it for you? Do you feel like you want to take this to a certain level exit, try something else, or is this like fully all in, realize it to full potential, try to get it to IPO, whatever that might look like, you know, not necessarily that specifically, but the option of kind of deal. I think we're all in here for, for a while, like startups are startups, right? You know, sure. I don't know how long it'll last, how long it'll take to do these things. Right. But at this moment, you know, it's, it's, we're all in to try to get this thing where it needs to go. Um, when we talk about where Caliber Mind is going, you know, I'll be honest, I, I think we've spent a lot of time over the last couple of years trying to deliver really good analytics into the marketing rev up space. And, and I've come to a realization that there is a percentage of marketers and rev ops people who can really use analytics and leverage it to make really good decisions. And there's this big chunk over here that because they're too busy, because of other factors, because of things they probably will never look at a chart or a report or a graph, no matter how good they are, and you put it in front of them. And I think the challenge has been for any analytics product in this space is that everybody's focused on that 15%. Yeah. What we're working on right now is we've built a system that allows us to make, to really understand the questions these people are asking and figure out the answers. And we're building a system now that's gonna allow us to put that in front of these people in a way that they don't like have to look at a chart or a graph or anything. It's gonna figure out exactly what they're kind of looking for and get it right in front of them. And our goal is to be able to allow, think of any campaign manager, market or salesperson to act as if they had this sort of dedicated data scientist, marketing analyst working 100% just for them, telling them, look at this right now, this is something you need to do and here's some suggestions of what you do about it. Mm. Right, and getting that stuff right in front of them right then so they don't have to go looking for it. Like, and that, that's what I'm so excited about is like being able to like, I know our system that we built has all the data, all the pieces, and we've been working toward this for a couple of years. We're about ready to sort of put that last piece on top that allows us yeah. to kind of deliver that promise to marketers. And I think that opens up a giant portion of the market that to be honest, no one's really gotten to yet. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, that goes back to your earlier point, which is like go to market strategy. Some of the things, you know, the, the again, the intangible stuff where, you know, a product person engineer may not have that ingrained in them, you know, in, in that sense, but it's so, so important to, to really understand. Right. And like even having the patience and the wherewithal, because a lot of times it's like, you want to build this very sophisticated product, but it requires a tremendous amount of data. And so you have to be patient to build out in stages, the product to capture this data that then can actually be utilized to 
create that vision or you know hit that value prop that you wanted to do five years ago, but didn't have enough information to do it. It's been the promise that we've always been kind of aiming toward, but it's just now getting to the point where our system has gotten enough breadth, sophistication, and capability yeah. to be able to really start to deliver on it. Yeah, yeah that's super awesome. Um, well, on that note, thank you so much for joining us today and carving out the time, I'm sure, in your super busy day. Um, lots to be picked up on here, I feel like, for others that uh, might be mirroring your similar journey. So thank you for sharing. Um, if there's anything else you, you would like to add. Thank great. you so much for having me on the show here. I really do appreciate it. Awesome. Thank you.